Bill Gady and um, Team Prague to tell you that we are the last generation humans on Earth. I'm going to argue that we have nothing, we can't do anything about it. Uh, despite our intelligence, despite our technology, despite our ability to see the future and uh, solve problems, we cannot solve this problem. In order to see where I got this crazy idea, it's uh, worthwhile to see uh, what happened to the animals in the past, the animals that disappeared throughout the history of life on Earth. There's a graph that shows the number of species that disappeared in different ages. And the question is, what happened to these animals? If we can figure out what happened to them, maybe we can extrapolate that to us and find out if that agent or that mechanism that got rid of these animals, if we can overcome it. If we cannot overcome it, well, two things. First, we confirm that, yeah, we know how they died because they couldn't do anything about it. And second, we know how we're going to die. That's what I'm going to do today. As you can see, there's been many extinctions throughout the history of life on Earth. And the number that's kicked around is that over 99% of the species that existed are no longer here. Now, that sounds pretty much like a law of life, a law of nature. And the question is, is Humans are above that law. If we are an exception to that law, will we live forever? Or will we become extinct at some point? So how did they die? Well, there are many theories that are being kicked around, but we can lump them in two baskets, in two categories. We have the gradual climate change, environmental change, extinction theories, and we have the sudden uh, catastrophic. Catastrophic theories are very popular because they make for good Hollywood movies, right? That people like the flashy special effects. Here are a couple of examples. We have the Cretaceous extinction, allegedly caused by an asteroid. The second most popular is the Permian extinction, 250 million years ago. The primary theory kicked around is volcanic activity. Siberian traps swamped the land with lava. Another popular one is the Ordovician extinction, uh, happened 400 plus million years ago. And the rising star there, pushed by NASA, is that there was a supernova and that uh, the gamma rays hit the Earth. But there's a problem with some of these theories, several problems. One is that they cannot explain selectivity, which is the only thing that an extinction theory has to explain. How does Mother Nature choose one species? and allow another one to live. You can't do that with an asteroid because an asteroid is not that intelligent. So what have they done? They've created secondary mechanisms. It's not just one agent, it's several agents in a row, one causing the next one. And you might say, well, so what's the problem with that? <clears throat> but there is something wrong with that. And I'll just give you an example. Uh, imagine if uh, you say, well, how did the uh, mosasaurs, the uh, Animals, the reptiles that lived in the seas that disappeared at the Cretaceous extinction, right? How did they die? Well, we killed them with a knife. Well, how did the uh, T-Rex die? Well, we killed them with a spear. Well, how did the, uh, the uh, flying reptiles die? Well, we machine gunned them. So you create one agent to justify each habitat or each species. All you're doing is avoiding selectivity. You're making an ad hoc theory. And you're pushing up against what is called Oakham's rule. Uh, you have to make a simple theory. When it's very complicated, it's harder to believe. And the final problem that is, yeah, it's that it, like a catastrophic theory causes total extinction. It wipes out all plants and animals. In fact, that's what they argue. Here's a, an example. This is the Cretaceous extinction. And this is just one example here. We have the asteroid striking Earth. Does that kill all the animals? No. That kills all the animals from a radius from ground zero. So how do the animals on the other side of the planet die? Well, for that, they had to create a tsunami. The asteroid hits the waters, causes floods. Uh, all the plants and animals on land are drowned. Is that it? No. We have more another mechanism. The uh, rock hit the Earth, exploded into a million pieces, all these sizzling stones now rain down upon the animals. 
we have fire and brimstone, just like in the Bible. Does that do it? No. We have one more, uh, one more uh, cause, one more mechanism. The rock pulverizes, and the dust covers the entire earth. Sunlight can't get through, and what happens is plants can't synthesize. Whatever plants survive the first two mechanisms, nothing is left alive. Is possible? Well, if you look at the, the people who propose these theories, if you look at their websites, you'll find something called the plant evolution timeline. This is just one example here that I'm showing. You'll find many examples, and you never find that plants disappear completely. It never has all plant life disappeared, but this is what their theories say. So there's something wrong with these extinction theories that, were, that are being kicked around. The <coughs> but there's something we can we can salvage from all these theories. I just want to point to the, what it, some of these say. They say what collapses, what disappears, is a food chain. Okay, whether you talk about the Cretaceous, Permian, or Ordovician, they all go to the food chain. And it can't be any other way because, by definition, mass extinction is the disappearance of a food chain. That's what disappears. One food chain disappears, the other one continues as of nothing. So now we have to explain what causes that. If we were at the beginning of the Cambrian, 540 million years ago, we should be able to predict that archaic plants are going to die and they're going to be replaced by more modern, more advanced plants. That's the history of life on Earth. We started out with uh, bryophytes. These were the first plants to come on land. The animals that depended on this source of food had nothing else to eat. There were no flowering plants, there were no conifers, there were no no uh, ferns. These were the only plants available. So they developed a millions of years of relationship with these plants. That's what they ate. Now the plant disappears. It's pushed away by a new modern plant. In this case, we had the uh, club mosses and the horse tails. They came out around the car came, uh, days of the Carboniferous, 300 plus million years ago. So these plants pushed the other ones aside. The animals that forged the relationship with the older plants, they disappear with the plants. And that's what happened in each case. The amphibians, they were uh, tied to the club mosses and horsetails. When the mammal-like reptiles came, the synapsids came into Permian, they were tied to the ferns. When you look at the dinosaurs, they were tied to the conifers, specifically to the cycads, cycadioids, and ginkgos. And our species, you know, we are mammals. We were born and we developed with the flowering plants. What do we eat? We eat uh, tomatoes, we eat uh, vegetables uh, such as uh, lettuce. Uh, yeah, this is what we eat, right? Uh, and uh, we eat potatoes, we eat corn. Let's take all that away. Can we eat conifers? Can we eat Christmas trees tomorrow? I mean, plants are plants, right? Any plant will do. No. A cow eats grass. You take the grass away, he cannot eat pine trees. Not overnight. He developed after millions of years, or his, his dynasty comes from a lot way back when, right? The cow is what we have today from some other animal that came before him. But all these animals develop with respect to the flowering plants. You remove the flowering plants, they will die, 100% sure. So uh, what causes extinction? It's the black horse of the apocalypse, the third horseman. That's the, he comes in, it's famine, and he does it through hunger. He does it through starvation. That's the mechanism of a mass extinction. What happens is the ecological pyramid overturns. If you look at a normal shape pyramid, it's uh, got a 10 to 1 ratio between trophic levels. The lowest trophic level is 10 times at least as high as the next level, which is 10 times as high as the uh, next level. So the mass that you have at each level is there's a 10% difference between them. What happens towards the end of the species lifetime when we have a mass extinction? The pyramid overturns. We have the many chasing after the few. And they die of starvation. That's what happens to the last dynasties. And this is the, called the Cretaceous Terrestrial Revolution. And you can see that in the last 50 million years of the Cretaceous, the flowering plants, the angiosperms, they muscled aside the conifers. So what happened? To the, uh, to the dinosaurs. What happened to them was they lost their source of food. You know, we developed with the uh, angiosperms, we had no problem. We radiated with them. So we did not suffer like the dinosaurs did. 
So you might say, well, what does this have to do with man? We produce as much food as we want. We've got the technology to produce more food, maybe twice as much food as we have on the planet right now. We feed 8 billion people on Earth every day. That's a, that's a pretty good uh, rate there. We can do that with 8 billion people. But we do it thanks to money. Our food chain is the chain of money. We call it the money chain. We have a producer that uh, produces food. He delivers it to a manufacturer or packager or whatever. Uh, this person uh, gives it to a delivery guy, the delivery truck. He comes to the city, gives it to the supermarket, and we, the <laughs> consumer right at the bottom, we give them money, which is the, the red arrows. Uh, money goes in the opposite direction all the way back to the farmer. We do it for profit. You know, we, we, uh, the farmer doesn't produce food for you because he wants your health or because he loves you. He does it for money, only for money. If you raise money, and now what happens to food? All we need to do is eliminate money. It's just that simple. So when God comes back to earth uh, sometime in the future, it doesn't have to rain down with asteroids or, uh, you know, fire and brimstone, floods, uh, nuclear weapons. All he has to do is he raise money. He wipes out money and our food chain collapses. We have, we die like the dinosaurs die. We have the many chasing after the few. We have whatever foods on the planet at that moment in time. That's all the food that's, that's available for all of us. No one's going to produce another bit of food because money has disappeared. Okay, so the uh, skeptic said, okay, yeah, yeah, we raise money, we have no food, if we have no food, we die. Everybody can understand more or less that train of thought. But what are the chances of money disappearing? Is it possible for money to have zero value? Nobody gives uh, uh, money any value anymore? Is this possible? Well, let's look at this. Uh, we, we, we have two problems with that argument. The first uh, problem is the difference between possibility and the probability. Between can, what we can do, and what we will do. Can we press the button? Can we throw the nuclear weapons at each other? Yes, we can. Physically, we can press that button and we can blow each other up. We can do that. Will we do it? That's a separate question. Some people might say, well, the probability of that happening might be 90%. Another person might say, well, I think it's only 50%. Another guy might say 10%. But whether we can or not, it's a black or white issue. Yes or no, on or off. We either can or we can't. It's either possible or it's impossible. And the same thing with money. Money, we can. Can you burn your, your dollars? Can you burn your, your euros, your, your money? Yeah, you can burn it. You can come with a fire and burn it. You can do it. Now, will you do it? That's a separate issue. And in fact, I can come up with a couple of ways that we can destroy money. We created money. It's a concept. Just a concept. It's nothing ground in stone. We used gold at one time. We used, we used uh, in the days of the Bible, they used uh, to pay people with uh, barley. We had all kinds of money. Today, we have electronic money, just zeros and ones on a computer. Now, is that easy to wipe out? 90% of the world's money is in the form of electronic money. Oh, what if a government gives us $10 million a piece? We go to work? No, we destroy money because we're all rich. Why do I have to go to work? You know, I can just go and become a consumer. Why become a worker? What if companies lay everybody off? Instead of making us rich, we make everybody poor. You have no money now to buy anything. So we can destroy money that way, or we can just have the governments raise the global debt beyond the ceiling. We create so much money every day, finding money has no value. At some point, the real wages of the worker disappear. So there are ways to destroy money. And all I'm saying here is we can destroy. Not that we will, but we can. And that's the pro uh, second problem with the argument of the skeptic. The skeptic thinks that I'm saying that uh, we will do it. We're going to put our heads together and say, let's destroy money. Let's commit suicide. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying no matter what we do, money will disappear. You say, how is this possible? Well, let me show you a couple of graphs here. 
the bottom one is the world gross domestic product. It's all the value we produce for the entire planet, every country. The red one, that's how much debt we have. And you can see it's been rising, and it's continuing to rise exponentially. Governments are selling bonds, collecting money, they create debt, and that debt keeps rising. But the real value of goods is more or less a flat line. We, the world is growing at maybe 1% or 2% a year. But the, but the rate of debt is going through the ceiling. So the question is, can we continue raising the debt forever? This is another trend. This is the number of workers. We're in the unemployment society now. We had 200,000 years of hunter-gathering. We were just like any other animal. 10,000 years ago, we started doing farming. 300 years ago, we did industry and manufacturing. And 30 years ago, we went into the services. And now we're in the unemployment society. Now we can't find work. The new generation has problems finding work. Why? Because we are automating everything. We're innovating everything in the workforce, services, manufacturing. You go to the airport, you check yourself in. You go to the bank, you get your own money. You don't need a bank teller anymore. Everything is being replaced. And we can't avoid that because competition forces us to be efficient. So what's happening? Uh, we're not creating wealth. Well, and we have less and less work, less meaningful work. And we have more and more welfare and unemployment. We're in the unemployment society. But this is the good news. Let's go with the bad news. The bad news we had uh, stock market crashes. We had one in 2000. We lost $5 trillion in that bubble burst, which was the dot-com burst. In 2008, we had the, the uh, bubble burst for the housing market. $7 trillion were lost there, and lots of jobs, more than 2 million jobs. And now we have the biggest bubble, the mother of all bubbles. It's the derivatives bubble. Now, you'll have to look up exactly if you don't understand what a derivative is, but there's 500, 700 trillion, it's more than 500 trillion uh, dollars, 700 trillion monster out there. In comparison, the total U.S. economy is 19 trillion. 19 trillion. And, uh, and so if these bubbles pop, you know, we won't need God to raise money. We, we, we will wipe out money all by itself. Thank you.